issues. I know you and myself and David Weisbach and Bob Topel taught uh, class this year on big problems and in that class a bunch of issues came up that were related in many ways to health in terms of innovation and, and growth and the value of health and things like that over time and one of the things you talked about and Bob Topel and I've written on is just how valuable innovation has been. I think people often forget just how much of a gain people have gotten over the years in terms of increased longevity. You would say innovation, while maybe it's distorted, is not something we'd want to stop. We wouldn't want to freeze healthcare treatment any, in any sense of the world, right? No, I agree. I want to draw a, an important distinction. I think your work with Bob uh, has very soundly demonstrated how valuable the health improvements over the last, you know, over the last century, but uh, in particular since 1970s have been. It is certainly the case that if you value those, the value of those uh, improvements in health are greater than the additional amounts that we spent on treatment during that period. Uh, I think that's very clear. I think the thing that's a little bit open to question is whether or not healthcare has actually contributed to that improvement in health. I think there's some evidence of it, but it's not an open and shut case. Um, so I have looked at, at some of these sort of questions. It's very hard to get at causation. How much has the technology, uh, new technology, new drugs, actually improved health, but we can look at, for example, for individual technologies, how valuable they've been. Just in the way that you, you found that people undervalue the, the improvements in health we've had, uh, we've done some research suggesting that the technologies that are out there, we undervalue today. We don't, uh, like for example, uh, the way that we show this is most people that look at technologies use something called cost effectiveness analysis to value it, which is they look at how valuable this drug is to a sick individual, uh, quantify that in terms of uh, improvements in life and what the what the dollar value of that improvement in life is or quality of life is and then they subtract off the cost of that drug and then they say is this cost effective but the important thing there is that most people have valued that from the perspective of somebody who's sick so if you have HIV what is the value of having heart quite substantial uh, one of the things that my colleagues and I so this is uh, Dryas Lakdawana a student of mine and Julian Rafe uh, did was think about well, what is the value of that innovation to healthy individuals. As a healthy individual, I value that too. So, for example, if you take an individual who is, uh, you know, uh, um, engaging in sex uh, back in 1990, uh, there is a risk that you might get HIV uh, and thus uh, get AIDS. And that's a big risk. Uh, and even if you don't have it, uh, anything that affects how bad HIV is uh, affects how bad that risk or the, the uh, you know, how, how, how valuable sex is or how costly sex is. In 1990, that meant that, you know, if you're sexually promiscuous, you had a risk of getting HIV, and that means basically a death sentence in two years because of AIDS. But if you jump forward to, say, 2000, and heart comes out, and all of a sudden you can live for 25 years uh, on HIV, uh, you eliminate that death sentence. You can get HIV and you don't die in two years, maybe you die. You're not trying to get HIV, you but the consequence if you get it isn't nearly as bad. Exactly. Now, that's just from the perspective of somebody that's healthy. And I, I don't mean somebody has to be sexually promiscuous or engaged. This is just an ordinary individual uh, uh, having sexual interactions. There's always a risk. And so that, that is a benefit for the healthy individual. Uh, and so we said, you know, okay, so if we do that, now, now what is the value of medical innovation? Uh, and we found that it's, it's quite substantial. So, so let me stick with the heart example. So, Let's suppose that uh, the value of a life year is 50,000. That means that people are willing to pay up to $50,000 to live a year longer. Uh, let's not quibble about that particular number, but it's a common number that's bandied about. So if we say $50,000 and you die two years uh, uh, because once you get HIV, you know, in the pre-heart era, that means that you're facing a risk, small risk of getting HIV, which means a loss of about, a, uh, you live basically 100,000. You, you live for two more years and then you die, right? Uh, uh, but that's a very, very big loss. Versus living, if you didn't get HIV, maybe you're going to live 30 more years. 30 more years, right? Then the, the risk, the gamble changes dramatically. Right. And then you want to ask yourself, so you're, you're basically gaining life years. Uh, and the question is, uh, you know, how much are you willing to pay for that? And what does heart charge? So the, the very first thing to think is that if heart saves you, you know, $50,000 a year of life, right? Um, you would think that, that if they charge $50,000 a year, you wouldn't get anything. 
That's not true. One of the really important insights that we, ha we had was one of the things that, that medical technology do does is it converts something that's a not insurable physical risk to your health into something that's a financial risk that you can insure with a financial contract. There's no amount of insurance I can buy in 1990 that would allow me to smooth or kind of reduce the risk from dying from AIDS. So in other words, there, I, if before heart came out, I'm going to live two years. Now I'm going to live 20. So heart gives me 18 years. There was no way, no matter how much I was willing to pay, that I could buy those 18 years before, yeah. before heart came out. It wasn't like, I'll give you a million dollars, give me my 18 years. You can't like, get it. Science was a limit. Right. Uh, technology was a limit. Even if Hart charged you full price for each of those, those years, $50,000 a year to use, you would pay it because you could at least buy it, right? You could buy your life. Um, now, there's a second thing that, that Hart did was it wasn't priced at $50,000 a year. It was priced at something like $5,000 a year. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, you went from a risk of, you know, I could face a, a loss that's $50,000 a year to a loss that's just $5,000 a year. So it reduced the actual magnitude of the risk as well. And those are two effects. One is making... Uh, allowing you to purchase that additional life. And the second thing is it reduced the price of that life. Those are two different things. And when we included that in calculations, we went back to, there's a nice database of, of technologies that Tufts maintains. We went through about 2,000 technologies and we calculated this additional benefit. And we found that once you did that, the value of technologies, the cost effectiveness estimates doubled, which is very important. Now that's not the same thing as explaining all the improvements in health, but it does show that these technologies are twice as valuable as we think. And interesting, you know, going back to our discussion about health insurance. So remember, one of the things that, that Hart did was allow you to buy health the way you often bought health is through health insurance. And we tried to value what is the benefit you get from having health insurance as opposed to just having the technology. And we found that the technology, in terms of how much it helped you smooth or reduce your risks, was worth about 10 times more than the health insurance. And that's because technologies weren't always priced at $50,000 per life year. They were sometimes priced less, particularly valuable technologies, especially when they go off patent. Mm -hmm.